Hello and welcome to episode 22 of Romance Isn't Dead. <laughs> Today we are going to talk about a half a girl living in a mortal world. Yes, we are digging into Julie Kagawa's The Iron King. I'm Sally. And I'm Ray. Hello. Hi. I'm so blaming you for this. I've got Barbie Girl in my head. If anyone else sang the first line of Barbie Girl when they heard the title to this episode, you are not alone. <laughs> Smiles. Oopsies. Yeah, you're not guilty. <laughs> you're not feeling no. it anyway. <laughs> not at all. Are you kidding me? Please. As if. As if. Anyway. How are you this week? I'm like having to earn my paycheck. What is that about? I know. It's so unfair. What? I mean, come on. Why don't you just give me money just to like, you know, not show up? That would be better. Or at least no. show up and just sit there doing something else. Like I could, I don't know, read our next book or something. But no, I actually have to work. What? Yeah, I know. I know, right? Oh, well, yeah. such is life. Such is life. Such is life. What about you? you? Need to win the lotto. Oh. <laughs> I'd totally buy you a house. Totally buy you a house if I won the... Yeah. Um, and I don't mean like a $4 lotto. I mean like the lotto. Totally I'd buy you a house. Because yeah. I'm your friend. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I have to return the favor. I totally, uh -huh. definitely move to somewhere warm. <laughs> I know we, we've had some good weather recently, but in the last couple of days, it's turned to um, gale force winds and warnings of floods. Uh, I don't like it. It sounds like the apocalypse, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, if you read the newspaper, you'd probably think we were. <laughs> anyway. Wow. There's so yeah. much bad stuff going on right now. Can we, let's not talk about the bad stuff. Let, let's, no, that's, let's... that's what we're doing here. We're trying yeah. to... Let's, get out of the bad stuff and get yeah, into the good. Yeah, let's talk about... We decided, sort of together, this is technically Ray's pick, but we decided really together. Uh, Ray wanted to do a YA novel. And so YA is neither of our necessarily jam, I guess is the way to put it. Is that fair? Yeah, I've got a couple of books in YA that I love, but mm -hmm. they are original YA before the introduction of Harry Potter and Twilight. Mm -hmm. I had to really restrain myself then from saying the, the name that I always give that book. Yeah, um, <laughs> had to restrain myself and I managed it. And The Hunger Games. And my, my favourite YA has been YA since I was actually a tween. And that is Margaret May's The Changeover. Mm -hmm. Don't watch the film. My recommendation, do not watch the film. But... Um, that was my real introduction to YA. And then, of course, I get into my 30s, I suppose, mm -hmm. late 20s, early 30s, and YA becomes a massive money maker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I don't even really remember a YA book that truly stuck with me like just off the top of my head. And Ray and I have found that, that we we have some challenges when we when we want to try to find books that she and I both have relatively easy access to. And so, because, you know, we really don't want to spend all of our money on books. We do have other things we have to spend money on. So yeah. So, Electricity. <laughs> right. I mean, internet connections, for instance. So oh, yeah, that's important. So we looked for a book that, that we could both get our hands on with relative ease and, and was available for, you know, not a lot of money. And so after some searching, I found Julie Kagawa's The Iron King, which is the first in a series called The Iron Fae. And it sounded like it was kind of up both our alleys because sort of a supernatural twist and and it was YA. And it was published by Harlequin Teen, I believe, in 2010. I'm, I've got the book in my hand, so I apologize for the book page turning sound that inevitably you're hearing there. Yes, 2010. Yeah, we're, we're offering, we're offering um, special effects now. Yes, well, there you go. I mean, obviously, just you take it as, you know, important things. But, but yes, 
Julie Kagawa published this book in, in 2010, and one of the reviewers, at least, said that, quote, Julie Kikawa's Iron Face series is the next Twilight. That was from teen.com. And it is the first in this series. Book one, Iron King. Book two was Iron Daughter. Book three was Iron Queen. And then book four was the Iron Knight. And that actually came out in November 2011. So these books came out in very rapid succession. We could get into discussions of publishing and, and writing and how she probably wrote most of this before the first book even came out. But regardless, this this is kind of an old series, but you could probably get your hands on it at your local library if you're interested in it. And obviously this is a no holds barred discussion. So there will be spoilers for the Iron King in this. Um, is there, did you, did you want to kick this off, Ray? Well, okay. Well, I can give a brief summary of the book. Mm -hmm. This is all about Megan, who is just coming up to her 16th birthday. So she's getting ready to take her driver's test and everything else. Um, I have to admit that right at the very beginning, I got rather confused and it wasn't anything to do with the writing. So I think there was, it felt like there was some confusion on purpose and that was to do with her father's disappearance. Right. 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 Because she was told, um, she apparently went to the park with her father when she was six, mm -hmm. and he sent her off to get an ice cream. Mm -hmm. And she came back, and all that was left of him was his shoes. He had apparently like walked into a pond or something, yeah. But they never, but they never found his body. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, judging by the title. I'm reading mm. the back of the book. My mm -hmm. brain immediately went to, well, her dad, that was clearly a fair. He was obviously fair. magical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then mm. you read and it's, it wasn't her father. It was her, her mother's first husband, her, her first stepfather. Mm. And my brain went and exploded with the, okay, I'm confused now. Anyway, Megan's coming up to her 16th birthday. She's got a younger brother called Ethan. Mm-hmm. Um, and she lives with Ethan's father and her mother. Mm -hmm. And her father, uh, Sally and I were both talking about this a little bit earlier. And it's there, there's some very clever foreshadowing at the beginning of the book when you mm -hmm. first meet her stepfather, who almost seems to look through her mm -hmm. as though she's not there. And you think, uh, initially, you think, oh, he sounds like a really horrible person, or mm -hmm. maybe she's, or maybe she's a brat. You you just don't know. And my mind, when I read um, the family dynamic, immediately went to um, Sarah in Labyrinth, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where but she has a much better relationship with her younger brother, mm -hmm. who's three, I think. Four, three, four, something like that. Four, three or I think. four. Yeah, I think four. She, yeah. She's she's very close to him, and clearly adores him because she goes. Um, he is exchanged for a changeling mm -hmm. who tries to kill her mother Bless and her heart. Ethan, yeah obviously the kid not the yeah. changeling yeah these he, are these are not lalini sings changelings by the way no no these are, are, no, these these are terrible are, you know the the story the, the the stories that you read as a child the fairy tales where a child is kidnapped from their crib and replaced with a fairy child so the child can be brought up in the fairy world mm -hmm. and the changeling assimilates but they are still quite evil that's this child he's horrible um not ethan the changeling that replaces him wow we're getting confusing <laughs> Sorry. so imagine so, how he felt <laughs> and megan yeah i know exactly and Megan goes to her friend Rob for help mm -hmm. and it turns out that Rob is actually a fae. Puck. Puck, yeah. But it's your favourite play, isn't it? No, Much Ado is my favourite play. But that that brings up a good point. One of the things that Kagawa does well is that she does use familiar motifs. Even if you have like no ground specific grounding in the fae like you haven't done any research on the fae she pulls things that we have heard right so we've heard everyone pretty 
pretty much, has heard of Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream. And they've heard of Puck, right? They've they've heard of these And they know that it's Robin Goodfellow. Right. And so, you know, there's that. And then I, as I was reading, especially when she got into the part where there's the big dinner and the unseelie court was coming to visit. Okay. I recognized a lot of those creatures by, okay, you're going to judge me and I don't want to hear about it. Okay. But <laughs> I recognized a lot of these because I read a lot of the Mary Gentry books from Laurel K. Hamilton. So I had heard of these types of characters like red caps and whatnot from Laurel K. Hamilton's Mary Gentry series. So they were not. Um, Laurel K. Hamilton, for those of you who don't know the Mary Gentry series, that is one of her less popular series or less it's the one that it's the one that's full of a lot less sex oh you say that (laughs) it's not that but anita blake gentry isn't as bad as anita blake see i didn't really read the anita blake series i just read the mary gentry series and so anyway i heard i had heard of you know jack frost and i had heard of all these other characters that show up or types of characters that show up in these different courts. And I was prepared for the Fae to be capricious and basically jerks from actually reading Mary Gentry series. <laughs> yeah, but and, at least that's the thing. It, that's, that's it, isn't it? You're familiar with them. I mean, I don't know where I first read of um, read about the red caps and everything else, but I did. And I've read books. And I haven't read the Mary Gentry series. Right. Well, I will say this. She, she, Julie Kagawa, does a good job of pulling in some of those motifs that, like, it's not jarring if you have read other series or you know something about the Fae. Her, her take on it from Oberon all the way through, it's not a jarring kind of thing where you're reading it going, that's not how that works. It, it really, to me, seems to fit in with the, with the myths of the Fae as they sit and I'm sure that that is on purpose from Kagawa. Yeah, I think right. that she's she's pulling in a lot of um, familiar tropes almost mm-hmm. when she brings her characters together because you've got the very taut and tense relationship between Titania and Oberon, even though they're married. Right. Because political union, if, obviously. <laughs> oh, very, very political. But she's jealous. And he's a bit of a playboy, really. Mm-hmm. So Megan is his only surviving mortal child. Mm-hmm. Right. So I, I'm just, yeah. And I get irritated with the queen because, she, okay, yeah, I get you, yeah, I get you don't want to see your daughter, do- your husband's, you know, illegitimate child, but. To send her to the kitchens like that? I mean, come on. You're terrible. You're really terrible. And I hope you die. I mean, I just... I hate her. I hate... You gotta understand, like, my my background. Anyone who treats a child, a blameless child, poorly, I'm like, large cliff, go take a leap. Because that's just not... That's not cool. At all. I don't... Mm-mm. I don't. I don't play that. I don't. I don't like it. I don't play it. We're not having this conversation. I just. I, I don't approve. And and let's be. She was going to murder her. Yeah, and I think that I think that that was done for effect, but it mm. also was done to show Megan's strength of character. Sure. Because she didn't let being stuffed in the kitchens and treated like dirt by the mm. kitchen staff affect her determination to do what she'd gone there for right. and that was find her brother and and she she defies oberon too right put on oh, this yeah. fancy dress no i don't think so i'll wear my ratty par- cl- yeah. yeah come to this party okay but i'm leaving <laughs> yeah i got don't to go. with that peace boy. out yeah peace yeah. out <laughs> So, you know, that, that in and of itself, like, Megan, 
Megan shows herself to be a very strong heroine. And I think that's a good role model for girls. If you're reading this, I think that that would be a good role model for a girl to, you know, don't, don't let the jerks get you down kind of thing. Yeah. I, can, I mean, I can she, she goes on the quest after she's left Oberon's court. She goes on to finish the quest to find her brother who is in mm. the Iron King's court. And she goes with Robin, mm -hmm. who is who was her best friend before she mm -hmm. even knew he was Park, and he was sent to guard her. And Ash, the prince of the Unseelie Court, or a prince of the Unseelie Court. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you're introduced to Ash, which is Early. in a glimpse, yeah, which is a glimpse, literally as she's on the bus on the way home from school on her birthday. As soon as you you see mention of him there is that kind of she might end up with him mm -hmm. if yeah. you haven't read the spoilers for the following books yeah but she i mean on this journey she witnesses a lot of pretty horrific stuff because kagawa doesn't pull her punches mm -mm. Mm -mm. she is um she witnesses sacrifice mm -hmm. in the form of the dryad giving her life to provide them with a wooden a wooden blade Mm -hmm. She witnesses Robin saving her, uh, saving lives and sacrificing himself, though he doesn't die, mm -hmm. but he knows he could. And then she carries on, even though she's mourning her friend, she's mm -hmm. desperately worried about her brother. And then she sees Ash get tortured mm -hmm. in a cave. And she carries on because she's got a mission. Mm -hmm. So she's not one of these weak, oh my God, my boyfriend's just died, boo-hoo, I can't carry on. Mm -hmm. Not naming any names, first few chapters of Twilight. Yeah, anyway. Um, and she's strong. Mm -hmm. So she is definitely, as you said, she is definitely a role model. She is sort of someone to look at and say, she didn't wimp out. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. However, there are things obviously that aren't incredibly amazing about the book. Nothing's but perfect. <laughs> no, but the message is good. Mm -hmm. uh, let's so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say as you probably thought instantly when you opened the book. Oh, the Sally's gonna have a problem with this. It's in it's first, first person. person. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it the minute I picked up the book. It was like, oh great it's first person yeah and then i, I did I, didn't i send a message to you at that point and say I oh you said it's first person <laughs> so and we were committed at that point right um yeah so, we're already committed completely so i just have a thing against first person that said this was actually a well-written book and it wasn't first person present tense no that would have i think that would have probably killed you off i i wouldn't have finished it i'd have read the first three paragraphs closed it and said right you're on your own because i just couldn't mm -mm, mm -mm, i just i don't know so it, it was actually well written and so i didn't get i wasn't mad at it i just don't prefer that and but that is it was a conscious choice on Kagawa's part to write in the first person and I don't know if that's sort of a trope of YA at that point or I don't know why Maybe she it was a choice but you know and, and I you can't know, help thinking it was sort of almost journal mm -hmm. right in and some if, ways and if you are a younger reader first person might appeal a little more and this is geared towards younger readers so first person might have been a conscious choice because sometimes younger readers prefer that. I know that my oldest daughter who is 11 has read so many Percy Jackson books and they are first person and she loves them. So I, I, it's not my thing, but it easily could be someone else's thing. So I'm trying not to, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to like hound the book because it's first person. It was something that that sort of take it sort of takes me out of the story because I know it's not me. <laughs> That's neither here nor there. So anyway, um, this is a pretty good sized book. It's over three hundred pages, right? It yeah. is. 
My copy had 363 pages in it. You had the same copy as me. Okay. And in the end, to me, it felt like a prologue. It felt like an unfinished story. But that's because it was. But then you think about, you said earlier, <sighs> that the books were released incredibly closely together. They were. Which which is kind of the thing for Harlequin in general. True. You think about it. They do, if you, if you read Mills and Boone in the UK or... Um, Harlequin in the States they tend to release a series very very quickly so you'll get one in May one in July and one in September so you've got three Mm -hmm. books in one go Mm -hmm. so that is probably that is probably why they did it the way they did so it's Mm -hmm. highly likely that Kagawa had finished the series when it was either pitched or published they published Mm -hmm. the first one with all of them written Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a case of you had to wait ages for the next book in the series. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm sorry. Let, you, you're right. To me, I'm trying to think how to put this without it being so. Harry Potter. Obviously, each piece is individual, right? And it has a beginning and end point of each school year, correct? Yeah. And the story continues, and you know the story is going to continue. And if you were a Harry Potter fan, between what books four and five, sit back and just relax because it's going to be a while, right? Mm-hmm. And between five and six, and six and seven, I, I remember those days. And my problem, of course, is I go pick up my book for book five at midnight, and I'm almost done with it by six a.m. Right. When I picked up six, when I picked up six, I was done by noon because I'm not sure I even went to sleep. And then, so, I mean, (laughs) but, you know, and then it's two years before the next book comes out. But with regards to this book, to me, it's a good place to stop. It's a good place to have a break because she's gotten her brother back. She's talked to her mother and now she has to go to the, the unsealing court. And she had she court. finally got the truth. Right. And she has to go to the winter court now. And so it's a good place to stop. But to me, it just felt like we were stopping mid-story in a way that, like, for instance, Harry Potter, for me, did not do. Although, technically, it's the same thing. Does that make sense? And maybe, yeah. maybe for me, it's a bother because with Harry Potter... I really wanted to know what was going to happen next. With the Iron King and with Megan Chase, I'm not sure I care that much. Maybe that's the difference. And yeah, exactly. I'm supposed to care more because I'm a woman, right? So I should care more about this female romance heroine than I do, you know, a little wizard. And I don't. And so I don't know. Maybe it's just, I think it's just a matter of personal taste, but. And it's also possibly a detachment. Mm. There okay. is that you've wrote the detachment for you because, as you said, you're not a 16 year old girl. True. You couldn't identify with her as much in but the first person. Ne- but I was never an 11 year old boy. <laughs> no, but you have that. You were never meant to be an 11 year old boy because it's not first person. True. So you're not reading it as true. The, you're not reading it as Harry Potter. You're reading it as an as a third person observer. True, very true. Whereas this right. one was first person. You're meant to identify with the character. You're meant to mm. be absorbed in her life. Mm. And if you're not, you're never going to attach to the character the same way. Whereas mm. when you read a third person, you can attach to them because you see every aspect rather than mm. everything through their own eyes. And right. I think that's the difference. True, very true. And I mean, a- I I'd read the next book, but I'm not rushing to the library where I know they actually have it. It was mm-hmm. the one book they actually had in stock, um, <laughs> Miracle. But I'm not rushing to go. Oh, I've got to read this. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed the book. Don't get me wrong. I enjoyed it. I loved the um, the way that she connected the mythos and she'd integrated two different parts of life. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, there were certain bits of it for me that didn't quite gel. Okay, so what didn't quite gel for you? Her immediate attachment to Ash. Really? You said, yeah, that 
we still know nothing about him. Okay. Even though she's, there's no conversation, there's no getting to know him, there's, it's almost as though they're drawn together because of their differences. He, you know what though, for me, it did bring to mind, and something I really do like is that whole love at first sight thing. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's real I, fun. I, so I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Love at first sight, right? But, and he is the bad boy in my head. Like, he's the bad, I get it. Like, the bad boy. And, you know, he, he's really bad, by the way. Like, he says, he said this, he's talking to her, something goes very wrong. Like, some creature attacks at the court and all this stuff. And, and he tells Megan, this means war. And she said, something like what does that mean for us and he listens and everyone says that means i'll kill you and i was but like then don't oh they my actually, God. but that's the thing i mean they felt they originally um after she sees him for the first time mm. very very briefly and robin says to her on the school bus oh that's ash yeah no. i thought i saw someone i knew yeah she said that and he leans up and goes ash like that yeah. and i could just i could just hear a voice saying that so yeah there's there's a lot to like about this book i think we're just kind of saying uh, maybe as adults it's not our book it's not the YA novel that we want to read i don't know what do you it's quite a mature ya mm-hmm. novel though that's mm-hmm. the one thing that did strike me as you think of ya and you think of um okay so the hunger games is a little bit bloodthirsty okay a lot bloodthirsty it's like really because no, you know <laughs> yeah a, the hunger games is bloodthirsty but at the same time and it's also rescuing the sister so you've got the development of the characters but at the same time there's no real mention of um incredible romantic love peter and katniss are kind of thrown together almost through mm. desperation and there's no it's it's almost like a press created love in many ways. Mm -hmm. And speaking of that, did you know Miley Cyrus and Liam Hemsworth are split up? Um, But apparently they're getting a divorce. But anyway, um, (laughs) your face. I know that was totally random, but that was purely because we were talking about Hunger Games. Um, Anyway. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Um, uh, This Anyhow. is the Romance Isn't Dead podcast. You can't talk about divorce. <laughs> Anyhow, that felt like a very um, contrived romance. These two, as you said, it's love at first sight. And they're almost star-crossed as well. Oh, oh, yeah, absolutely. And you know how I don't love star-crossed lovers. I know. I know you and, hate star-crossed. And here's the other thing. As much as I, uh, in the end, I kind of, I like the Ash thing. But... Here's the other thing that I don't relate to Megan Chase with. What? If it had been me, I'd have chosen Puck. Because he was her loyal friend? Yes. So I don't get it. <laughs> like, I, I, tell you what. I would have chosen Puck because he had been with her forever. And, and, and there are elements of this, you know, love triangle and all this stuff. And... I, I just, it, I would I would have chosen the other guy. And so I can't really relate to her because I'd have chosen the other guy, you know, so you know all who, of these things yeah. are, you know, it just, take, yeah. it took me out of the story a little bit again, because I am not Megan Chase, but I am having to read as if I am Megan Chase and it just bugs me. So first person, That's the thing. not my jam. It's really, it's really weird. I don't know if you ever read the Forbidden Game trilogy by LJ Smith. Uh, but Ash, yeah, it's got a lot of Norse mythology and a lot of runic, um, runic references. Mm-hmm. But is it first Ash person? Reminds, I don't think so. It's a trilogy. Um, then I, might I can't read. remember. It's been a while. It's been a while since I've read it. But anyway, Ash reminds me of Julian. Okay. And if anybody else has read the Forbidden Game trilogy, leave a comment below so I know I'm not alone. Or just like the, like the episode and let me know that I'm really not the only person that ever read this series. But he reminds me of Julian. Hmm. Okay. Okay. And I, I don't, I think it's to do with how he's described and his behavior, but it is mm. very Julian-esque. Okay. 
Well, so I think that's, is that it? Is that what we wanted yeah, to say about so. this? Obviously, we can't give this a um, chili rating. Yeah, because... we're talking like half a chili, if that. <laughs> there's no chili. <laughs> well, there's not, I mean, I think there's, there's a what, maybe two or, is there a kiss or two or three kisses? They're very. Mm-hmm. They're very, they're, they're, they're very YA friendly. And they're very um, irrelevant to the story because this story really is more Megan finding out who mm-hmm. she is. And finding and her brother. And, yeah. Finding her brother and rescuing him. But then you also mentioned, what was it you said about the foreshadowing? Well, with that's, foreshadowing, that's, she, like, she does a really good job of it. Um with with the foreshadowing in this book and the, i think that goes to again being a well-written book and if you are a reader if you picked up on something at the beginning then it, it gets explained and you you always feel a little successful oh i saw that yay and that makes you happy that you've done it so i i think that kagawa actually is pretty good at that and for an adult book it might feel a little heavy-handed but this is again a ya book so this is for people who are not as old when they're reading and and who are maybe not as accustomed or who are her intended audience is probably not as accustomed to real subtle foreshadowing and things like that. And so I think she does a really good job at, at what she's doing. Um, and uh, there was something else I wanted to say, but I don't recall exactly what it was. So I'm going to stop talking about it. So overall view. Um, I'm going to say I think it's a well-written book. I think it's a, good book it's just perfect for its target audience maybe yeah if the target audience is 15 to 17 ish maybe maybe 15 ish yeah uh, but it's it's not that there's anything in it specifically too old for a younger reader but it is i'm not sure like i'm trying to think of a reason why i wouldn't give it to my young child my 11 year old because she's pretty old for an 11 year old yeah but at the same time i just i'm just not sure if i would maybe it's the bloodthirsty red caps and i don't want to give her nightmares more so than yeah. any sort of explicit content and the scene in the cave yeah yeah i think that that's probably it more there so. is there is yeah there is a lot of blood well, blood, it is blood that it, it can be bloodthirsty. It's mm-hmm. not gruesome. It's not grotesque. It's not hugely violent. But there are certain elements of it that I think a very young or a much younger reader would have an issue with when they go to bed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And my child has a very fanciful imagination. And so the next thing I know, I'll be hearing about red caps in her closet. And I can't, I just can't. Well, that's the thing. I, I mean, that's that. isn't that what Ethan says at the beginning? There's yeah. a there's a there's monster a monster in my, my closet. closet. Yeah, and sure enough, there was. So, <laughs> uh, what do you do? I mean, go away. So, <laughs> all right. Our next read was my pick, and I started reading it and realized that it was from 198. First of all, 19, right? And I don't mean 2019. <laughs> 1987 and I thought to myself that we don't I don't think it's just so old at this point that I don't I don't want to necessarily pull it up on the podcast so the next thing that Ray and I thought we're also there's another book and it's actually pretty old it's probably just a few years newer than than this specific book but it is still pretty popular. Like it's 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 a it's a novel that I think you get your hands on fairly easily, and it's a novel. I think they've just released it on Kindle, right? So I mean, it's one of those novels that it's a classic, and it's not classic like Pride and Prejudice, like Ray's going to throw it us next time. But it is it is a classic in the world of of romance, and that's Whitney, my love. So, if you can get your hands on Whitney, my love, and that is Judith McNaught, and 
that would be what we're reading for next time. So yeah. it's a fan. It, it's the sequel to the book we read last week. No, week before, week before last. last. Yeah, and um, it was. It's the sequel to Kingdom of Dreams, mm-hmm. but it's three hundred years in the future mm-hmm. from that book, not from mm-hmm. now. <laughs> exactly. And it is. It is literally Judith McNaught's probably her best known book. Right. It's the book that she became known for, though it's not actually the first one of hers I read. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think it was the first one I read, though. I read it on a beach in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. It's a freshman in I high read, school. I read Always and Forever first. Hmm. Interesting. Well, there you go. So that's what we're doing next time, y'all. Uh, feel free to tune in for that. And is there anything else that we need to say? Uh, always search for your happily ever after. And I would remind you that romance isn't dead. It's alive and well on your bookshelf. Bye. Bye.